you guys still want to discuss during the class break, you're more than welcome to do so. And I, I believe that after tonight's lecture, you will have maybe better idea about <coughs> the overall picture of the optimization techniques for, especially for some engineering applications. And also for those of you who have not finished the fifth homework assignment, you can submit maybe in a later time. Just make sure that you examine all the possible configurations for the Lagrangian multiplier because we are dealing with the inequality constraints and also pay attention to how you check whether the solution is a local maximizer or minimizer. And sometimes you may need to read the textbook and understand a little bit better about the second order condition to check them. To check them. Okay, and tonight's lecture is about global search algorithms. And I see that we probably don't have all students here, but in order to keep you guys <coughs> a little bit motivated, I would say class participation is considered one important aspect for, of course, for the interactive lecturing. And in, well, in that case, I would say maybe for the student who has the most active participating in tonight's lecture, he or she will have a small trophy on that for doing that. Well, maybe you get, of course you can reject, then it will go to the next student who's active and also very interested in getting the trophy. Okay, so my first question is like, how many of you heard about these algorithms, which are considered global search techniques? I don't know what they are. You heard about the name? name okay. I'm sorry? Didn't we look at two of them? Branch and bound? Well, I think we, yeah, we talked about the branch and bound in the so-called linear mixed, uh, mixed linear integer programming. And we talked a little bit about simplex algorithm for linear program, which may not be applicable to global search. And we didn't talk about particle swamp optimization, and I don't intend to cover it tonight. What I plan to cover, probably I cannot because of the time constraint. What I intend to cover are genetic algorithms similar to the annealing and taboo search. And in your mind, what kind of algorithm is considered a global search algorithm? Yes? A force algorithm. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit? Meaning you try all possibilities possible. You test all of the feasible sets. Well, what if the decision variable is continuous? Then you, can then you cannot enumerate all the feasible solutions. Then you, if you can draw the Well, you can sketch, sketch yeah. the objective function, maybe also sketch the constraints, and then you can graphically identify if there's any global maximum or min minimal. Well, but that doesn't apply to real engineering applications. And what we are talking about tonight are algorithms for real engineering applications, which are considered very successful in different <coughs> situations, and they are treated as so-called global search algorithms. And what Sayer just mentioned is one important point. It doesn't really get into so-called local maximum or minimal and then stop there, which means even though the decision variable is continuous, and even though you may know the gradient direction, you may want to be very happy just end up with a local stationary point. So you mean this method can Global what do you think? Well, I, I never well <laughs> in general, the the objective is to find the global global maximum or minimal, and that in that case, it means something like what? Within the feasible set, we really want to find the optimal solution that we want to minimize, and in that case, of course, it's just a grand objective. Like what I said, I just mentioned for this great case, unless you enumerate all the feasible solutions, you probably cannot 
make sure, yes, you get to that. Or maybe if the problem has a very nice structure, like what we talked about last time, you can apply dynamic programming, which is more efficient than doing exhaustive enumeration. But still, there are problems where you can now make sure you are getting into the global optimal. So to put it in a more concrete context, none of these algorithms can guarantee that the solution is global optimal. But still, they are considered global search algorithm. Why? Any idea? If the solution, of course, for a well-defined optimization problem, in fact, there won't be a global maximum or minimal. But the problem is you don't know where it is. Even though you, search, you run your computer program for three days, you still don't know if the best solution you have is already global maximum or minimal. Yes? Can we say they're guaranteed to be suboptimal at least? Uh, well, that's an important point. And in fact, none of these algorithms can guarantee you the solution is already close to the global optimal with some quantifiable gap. But still, they are considered global search methods in contrast to so-called local optimization technique, like a gradient descent or Newton's method or quasi-Newton or conjugate gradient method. This method is not uh, related to uh, has no relationship to the to the start point, start search point, we don't have to select a point to start with. Oh, well, I think any algorithm you need to initialize. At least you need to start from somewhere. And some algorithm may require you to start from a feasible set, some may not, meaning that uh, the, the algorithm in itself can try to get to a feasible solution for you, provided you pick a point first. But that's not really the key, right? Well, it's, it's not, the initial point is not it's not important. Well, it will be somehow important. If I'm very close to the global optimal, then of course I'm happy, right? I, in, in general, I don't know. There's no clue. Okay, I think that's getting close to <coughs> the big picture of the global search algorithms. Meaning that there's a hope that these, by running these algorithms, you can get to reasonably close to the optimal one with better chance, like what Gan Liu just mentioned, even though we don't know. But just based on some experience, people say, well, these algorithms are very effective for some complicated optimization problems. If you use other algorithms, they may not be as good as these ones. And there got to be some reason behind it, even though mathematically we cannot really prove anything for all type of optimization problems. But still, they are important. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is called the genetic algorithm, which actually can be considered as a misnomer because it has nothing to do with the real genetic evolution type of the so-called Darwinian paradigm. But still, the technique borrows this idea of doing so-called crossover, mutation, reproduction. And then the most important technique is called the selection mechanism where basically you, of course, you randomly search some feasible solutions. And then based on that, you try to determine what you want to do next. If you are very greedy, you may say, well, I just search around the best, the neighborhood of my current best solution, or maybe those promising ones. Similar to the situation, for instance, if I only like those students who are very active in participating in the class, I will only talk with them and ignore other students. 
Well, that may not be a good strategy because what? In a complicated objective function, you may stack at some local maximum, minimal point where it may not be as good if you explore further. And of course, the generic paradigm for this so-called genetic algorithm is about maintaining certain size of populations, population in this case, candidate solutions, and then evaluate their fitness, and then try to see if they satisfy the constraints or not, and then basically select survivors like this <coughs> genetic fitness in biology, then you basically generate new candidate solutions and then repeat this process. And hopefully, because of the so-called evolutionary concept that works in biology area, and hopefully this mechanism also works for maybe more complicated but engineering related optimization problem. Anyone knows a little bit about the history of genetic algorithm? No? Well, in the context of biology, you can say, well, a species has better fitness, then it has better chance to survive, right? And in this case, of course, we have to convert what from evaluating the objective function to what some kind of probability that this solution is good, then I want to produce more close to that. And of course, <coughs> this is introduction level for genetic algorithm. There are many different variations on that. And also there are tons of publications related to using genetic algorithm to solve real engineering problem with specific design for the encoding or maybe evaluation procedure. I will just give you some basic idea, ask you to maybe think freely about if you have some real problem, how are you going to borrow this idea to design your, your own genetic version of the global search algorithm. And this technique is inspired by natural evolution. And of course, the original idea was invented by some professor at the University of Michigan who studied biological behavior and then tried to use that to do some real engineering design to fit basically some kind of construct where the objective function is fairly involved and also just evaluating the objective function is considered very expensive so that you want to find a good way to efficiently find some good solution without getting into like the shape of the objective function, gradient direction, and so on and so forth. And basically, the technique is generically applicable to many different optimization problems. And in this case, you can think about each individual <clears throat> Has to, um, solution has to be feasible to the original problem. And the individual is in general characterized by so-called fitness function. And usually higher fitness means better solution. And based on the fitness, then those parents or the existing population will be reproduced to generate offspring and maybe for new generation. And of course, better or fitter individuals have more chance to reproduce, and the new generation has a, in general has the same size of the old generation, and some population, some individuals have to go away, meaning that you cannot keep reproduce without selecting those elites. And those offsprings, in general, will inherit some good property of the, their parents, so that as the population evolve, eventually, ho hopefully, the best solution will, will be very, I mean, the solution will get in better and better and then eventually converge to the optimal solution. And this is just 
like algorithmic description of genetic algorithm. In general, no matter what version of genetic algorithm you're talking about, you have to begin, start with some initial population, and then you need to evaluate the objective function and come up with the fitness for each individual. And then you repeat this whole loop by doing in either <coughs> combining the parents for two of offspring or maybe do some random mutation of you individual and then evaluate the fitness of the offspring and maybe insert some new offspring by whatever mechanism you can use and then just keep doing that and hopefully the population of the same size will have improved the quality of the solution until Basically, you run out of your computa computational resource. You have to generate the best solution among this population. And do you know that's global optimal? But I think it depends on which fitness function you need. Because for different fitness it's important to different Yeah. For different objective function, of course. But in general, there's no way you can Make, you can be sure you get to the, optim, the global optimal solution. But this is basically based on engineering experience. You can fine tune your genetic algorithm, and there might be some kind of behavior like this. As you increase the number of generations, as just keep computing, then your fitness function increases. The best evolution may look like this. And on average, it will just keep going up until it reaches to some flat portion for a certain amount of time. And then you'll say, well, according to my genetic algorithm, there's no chance I can further improve my solution. Then you stop. OK. And if you think about this algorithm isn't really just a modification of random search. Instead of purely random, you try to take the advantage of some existing good solutions and try to do some combination from there. And the reproduction mechanisms have no knowledge about the problem to be solved. That might be good thing or bad th and bad thing. If you think that's good, which means it will be applicable to many engineering problems. You can always say, I download some genetic algorithm routine, I modify to my problem, I run and see what happens. And it can be bad because what? It's not designed for your own optimization problem. And sometimes it doesn't really care about the specific structure that your problem may possess. And of course, that's why I say this might be a misnomer for genetic algorithm to be, to be considered as an optimization technique where it doesn't really have concrete connection to like a biological evolution. It's just borrow the idea to, to do some informed search rather than purely random search. And of course, how are you going to encode you feasible solution and how going to evaluate the fitness function. These are important things to be successful in implementing genetic algorithm. And first is about the representation of your decision variable. Of course, you can use string with all parameters. In general, you can use even real number to represent. But to make it more realistic with genetic algorithm, you have to encode usually in some kind of binary sequence. And how to encode is important. And similarly, how are you going to evaluate the fitness function is also an important aspect in the design. If you can evaluate the objective function very efficiently, then of course that's a good way to speed up genetic algorithm, which usually is considered computationally expensive. On the other hand, the most important thing to become <coughs> successful in applying genetic algorithm to real engineer application is how you design this so-called crossover and mutation. And also, when are you going to stop when you run your genetic algorithm? Are you going to stop when you 
now the solution is satisfactory to your predetermined. For instance, I want my budget to be within $1,000. Then when it reached that, then I stop. Oh, you have some other prior knowledge. If you don't have anything about when to stop, then the only hope is that after running many hours, then if the algorithm cannot further improve the existing solution, then you stop. But this, of course, depends on how you're going to design your algorithm. And in general, some people call this individual feasible solution encoded string, but maybe binary string, as so-called genes. And in general, if you have genes joined together as a long string, people call that a chromosome. And these are terms, I think, for those who are studying bioinformatics, they know what they, they mean. But if, believe me, they have they have, these terms have nothing to do with the real bioinformatics. It's just the way to represent genetic algorithm. And sometimes people say this chromosome can form the genotype, and then genotype contains all the information to construct some organism. And this are like a biological analogy of how we try to produce the <coughs> populations when we do when we handle this optimization problem. Well, at this point, <coughs> I may want to ask you to think about how are you going to encode your feasible solution? You want, for instance, let's say if you have one decision variable within minus one to one, are you going to encode it by maybe a binary sequence? Or you want to have some smart way of designing it? Random number. Well, that has something to do with later. How are we going to evaluate the fitness? How are we going to do the reproduction, the crossover, and things related to how we select what solutions are considered good, right? So, <clears throat> You have some choice, like you can basically, you can say I quantize this interval from minus one to one to, let's say, 8,192 in intervals in uniform spacing, and then I can encode this by, I don't know how many bits. Nine, 10, 12? Okay, and then you, then maybe you, you use 12 bits to represent that. And the problem in this kind of scheme is that you can say each bit doesn't really correspond to each interval in some uniform pattern, right? Meaning that, for instance, the most significant bit is like maybe the leading bit to partition it into two big intervals. And that may not be very good. Well, I think one s improvement would be, for instance, you can shuffle this bit stream when you do crossover or mutation. And that we are going to talk a little bit when we get into the algorithm. For instance, if you think about <coughs> some problem you want to solve by genetic algorithm. Let's say you have n drops, and then you have n processors that can handle these n drops. You want to schedule this kind of drop to processor assignment, or, the, or even the sequencing of the, the processing sequence, so that the maximum span of this processing for the, to complete n drops will be minimized. 
And this will be very useful for manufacturing or even for like embedded system chip design. And the design would <coughs> consider what? Minimize maximum span and the fitness, of course, you can just evaluate the maximum span for each processor. And also you have some job to be assigned. And then what you can, the, the straightforward way to apply genetic algorithm, you would just try to generate a bunch of possible schedules and then do this so-called crossover mutation and then keep repeating that. And if you think about <coughs> what are the important operators in so-called genetic algorithm, there are two procedures people can say that are important to generate new feasible solutions. One is so-called crossover, the other is mutation. Crossover rely on like the, the encoded parents to generate the offspring. So you can say two, off, two parents produce two offspring, and there's a chance that the chromosomes of these two parents are copied unmodified as the offspring. And there's also a chance that the chromosome of these two parents are randomly recombined to form the offspring, and people call that a crossover. And you can design your chance of having the crossover, the location could be random, and the chance of having crossover, you can say maybe the probability is within 0.6 to even 1. And mutation is the chance that a gene or maybe a an encoded feasible solution will be changed randomly with some bit. So in general, this the chance of mutation is low. And you can think about crossover intuitively is a informed search which is not purely random. A mutation is somehow purely random because, for instance, you change one bit from one to zero, which means, for instance, you encode different region, then you jump from one region to another. Okay, make sense? So now, if you look at this genetic algorithm, it's a combination of random search and so-called maybe heuristic intelligent search based on the parents. And of course, there are different ways to do crossover. One is called a single point crossover, meaning that <coughs> some part will switch, the other part will switch, okay? So one point crossover, you can think about randomly, one position in the chromosome is chosen. And then child one is the head of the chromosome of parent one with the tail of the chromosome of parent two, okay? Which means if originally you have encoded the binary string to represent one feasible solution after the crossover, what will happen? You get two different feasible solutions and then you try to search on that. And of course, the new solution is correlated with the existing one, but the correlation structure is unclear, depending on your encoding strategy, okay? And there are different ways to do crossover. This is so-called a single point crossover, where the combination is this goes up and this part goes down, so it's just single point. The crossover is down here. And you can also have so-called a two-point crossover, and you can see that this part goes down and this part goes up. So, you, so some part of the chromosome switch. And of course, this is not really a binary sequence, but what, maybe you have trinary or maybe MRA sequence if you have a different encoding strategy to represent you so feasible solution. And of course, why it has such a name is because of the analogy to like the biology nature of the chromosome. And this is like two chromosome 
they cross and then they break and then basically this is one, one and two and two and then they cut it here and then the information has been exchanged. That's just the evolution. But why this idea works in optimization? I'm sorry? Well, In fact, if you ask me, I would say I have no clue why this should this should work. Well, this is purely phase that people say, if you think about like the biology system, sometimes it inherently optimizes something because of the natural selection pressure. So that if we borrow that idea to design our computing machine, there's a hope that if we can mimic well what the, like the natural mechanism organism evolves, then maybe it will serve some purpose for certain optimization problems. But this is just purely heuristic. And this is just another illustration on two points crossover, where you have the randomly selected two positions and then you you have a split of the chromosome, you exchange the information between the parents and the offspring. So that, of course, from two feasible solutions, you generate another two feasible solutions. You say, well, hopefully, these two will have better quality in terms of the fitness. And there are other ways to do crossover, like a random, a uniform crossover, which may be helpful when you have the encoding scheme, like a, the, using the binary sequence, where you first generate a random mask, and then the mask determines which bits are copied from one parent to the other parent. And the bit density in mask determines how much material is taken from the other one. And why this kind of mechanism? Of course, I, I would say it's just a way to make the inher the inheritance from the from the encoded bits bet among, uh, between these two parents more or less equal likely, so that you if you have a single point to do the crossover, sometimes because of the specific encoding procedure, the location of the bits carry some information on how you're going to search next, and that's not what you intend to do. So you want to use uniform crossover to avoid the dependency on the encoding procedure that you are used. So of course, one important question is whether uniform crossover is better than single crossover. And Again, there's, if you ask me, I would say there's no definite answer which one is better, depending on your particular engineering application. But that doesn't really carry any information if you really want to apply genetic algorithm to real engineering application. So what do you do? Well, maybe you can say I try some small scale problem to understand a little bit better. But the most important idea behind it is so-called the trade-off between exploration and exploitation. And that idea, in fact, is very important in many different areas, including machine learning, data mining, and some other contexts, like reinforcement learning, where exploration means you try to explore more. And exploitation means what? You don't want to explore more. You want to keep, you want to follow the existing good solutions. Well, I think the idea looks very familiar in some other context. If I, if I may, I can use one analogy. 
if I want to say who would be the best student in this class, and basically exploration means what? Something like I have to talk with each individual and see the individual performance. I need to grade more homeworks or things like that, right? And exploitation means what? Some kind of selection mechanism. I would say only those who pass the first computer assignment will stay. Others, I would suggest that maybe you, you should quit. Then I will focus only on those students. Well, I think this analogy makes some sense. In optimization, there's no hope you can actually explore every single feasible solution, do you agree? So what do you do? Any design will inherently face this issue. Like how much you want to explore, and then how much you rely on the information you already explored. Agree? And the major challenge is that in genetic algorithms, there's no guideline on when you should explore more and when you shouldn't. And later, we are going to talk about in some other applications, you can make concrete trade-off on this. And in fact, <clears throat> depending on how you encode the feasible solution, simple crossovers can have high chance to produce illegal offspring, meaning that the solution may not be feasible at all. Then in constrained optimization, it's very difficult to apply genetic algorithm if most of the time you just simply reproduce some infeasible solutions in your offspring, then you have to keep doing that, which is not very efficient. For example, how many of you heard about the traveling salesman problem? Okay, so maybe can you explain a little bit? Explore. Okay. Like for instance, like in US, maybe you want to start from Baton Rouge and then travel to maybe 50 states and then back to Baton Rouge. And then you want to visit each state capital just once. And the goal is to what? Minimize the total distance you're going to travel. And can we use dynamic programming to do that? is MP complete, so what? So we cannot use dynamic programming. Why it's different from the shortest path problem? In the shortest path problem, we pick Baton Rouge and then we pick another state capital as the destination and then we just calculate the shortest path, right? And in this case, what's the difference? Well, if we don't make cycle, would that be different? For instance, let's say, let's say if I start from Baton Rouge and end up with, let's say, which maybe Tallahassee, Florida, and then I want to travel 25 state capital and minimize my distance, would that make problem make would that problem be easier than traveling salesman problem, original travel traveling salesman problem? Why not? Okay, so. Okay, so shortest parts, usually you can easily, what, enumerate what, like intermediate state, like you have so called state one city, stage two city, you can basically have a structure to propagate in order to calculate the shortest parts, and there's a way to control that. And in traveling salesman problem, you can still do that. The problem is what? The number of states 
as the stage goes on, the number stay, the number sta stays keep keeps increasing exponentially, so that basically you cannot reduce the computational cost by doing that. Even though you can still apply dynamic programming technique, but the computational complexity cannot be reduced. And like what Lippi just mentioned, because we know this problem is considered NP-complete problem, meaning that it's as hard as some other class NP hard pro some other NP problem where people don't believe there's a efficient way you can get to the optimal solution. So we have to basically explore the chance that, for instance, applying genetic algorithm, we can get a reasonable solution within affordable amount of time. And in this case, if you do a uniform crossover, sometimes you can modify the original procedure to make it to make all these solutions feasible. For example, in the traveling salesman problem, if you just encode a simple pass to cover the city in a tour, then if you have mask being one, then you can copy the city from one parent. If the mask is zero, then you choose the remaining city in the order of the other parent. So that because originally it's feasible, then after some manipulation, you still keep it feasible. Meaning that if you first build a tour of the city and then just manipulate the edge. Make sense? But of course, in some other situations, things will be more challenging to maintain the feasibility for the crossover. And now we are talking about mutation, which you can say is a purely random mechanism to generate new solutions. And in this case, you can say, maybe a single bit or a single <coughs> location will change because of like the nature, you have this kind of mutation, and this will maintain the diversity of the individuals so that you can say in, in the analogy of from the biologically inspired idea of genetic evolution, evolutionary computation. Basically, crossover can explore the combination of current gene pool, while mutation can generate new genes. Meaning that you have existing candidates, and you try to use that to get to a good solution in the next step. Or maybe you just purely change a little bit to the existing one, and you, you can say that's like you randomly select another candidate as, as your new gene. And there are always control parameters in the design, like population size, crossover mutation probability. And these are, in general, problem sp specific. And you can always increase the population size in order to increase the diversity. However, in general, the computational time will increase for each generation. And you can increase the crossover probability, which means you increase the opportunity for recombination of two parents to get two offsprings. But sometimes, this could also disrupt some good combination. And you can increase the mutation probability. And this will be closer and closer to pure random search mechanism. However, it does help to introduce new gene in this, in this case. And I think that's just about how you generate new solutions. And then the most important thing is how you're going to keep good ones. Maybe you'll say, I always keep the best, current best solution. Would that be good? Well, it's, it is greedy, but it may not be a bad idea, right? Because I have large population, I say within this, I always have the best. And the best so that I can always keep track of the best solution. I don't lose any good gene pool in, in, that, in that sense. 
This is one idea. You say, I always keep the best one. And sometimes people use another idea, say, maybe let's delete the K worst solutions. They are leading to nowhere. We don't want to keep that. And the last thing is somehow like a probability selection. If your fitness is 10, my fitness is 1, then you have 10 to 1 chance being selected in the next offspring. And these are all the ideas. Which one do you like it more? Why? Okay. 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 What about other students? You like the last one. Okay. Why? You have some chance. Okay. Okay, um, Sarah, yes. Why not just use all three? Use, well, they are not compatible to each other. I mean, the first, you can keep the best one and still delete the K worst at the same time. Well, yeah, you can do that. And then you'll say the remaining one, you let your, your raw dice and let the probability to de determine that. Okay, yeah, that's also a very, very interesting suggestion. In fact, the first one was originally proposed in the initial version of genetic algorithm, which doesn't look very promising in a sense. Something like, I have the best one, the second best will be <coughs> subject to crossover and mutation. Probably doesn't really keep the good virtue of that. Maybe the second best is very close to the best one and still doesn't stand a chance. And then deleting k words, then depending on what, what would be the appropriate value of k, you delete one or two or maybe 90% of your population. Then I think what <coughs> Yu Liu just said is very interesting. Like maybe it's better just use probability weights based on their fitness or the object to the objective function. If your fitness is so large and outweighs other candidates, then you have very good chance to survive. And this last one, I would say I like the most. However, it's usually computationally expensive. Because anything that involves a probabilistic mechanism in general, it's not easy to implement. Even when you use computer to generate pseudo random number, it's not, remember that's not a purely random. And, and even that takes time to, for instance, how, do you know how to generate a random number? Yeah, lucky like MATLAB. Uh, okay, and how does, it, how does that work? Set your MATLAB okay. zero. You have to re reset MATLAB first. Yeah, basically my question is, do you know how, like, when you call like run or run n, yeah. how does that pseudo random number generator works? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's some number that Yes. Um, well, you need a seed number and okay. it's different algorithms. I think one of them is Mersini Twister. Okay. And depending on the algorithm, they have a certain length of period before the numbers begin. Okay, basically it's pseudo random because it's like you do some arithmetic calculation, right? For instance, one easy way you can say A raised to the power of B plus C mod modular P and P is a very large prime number. And then maybe it has a very long period. And then this pattern looks pseudo random. Depending on which C, the trigger starting from where, it looks more or less random. But in order to generate that, it's considered computationally expensive if you keep doing that. Do you agree? So there's always a trade off among these three. And there's no good way to say what is bad, which one you should pick. And sometimes, 
you also have some problem with how you determine the survival of an individual solution. If too strong, you have the fitness selection bias, then that can lead to easily lead to a suboptimal solution. And sometimes if you say the impact is too little, then this is close to just a purely random search. You don't have any way to keep good solution close to you. And because of that, then in general, we don't want to make a deterministic mechanism. We want to use the chance to select the parents proportional to their fitness. And there are different mechanisms, like in the textbook, I think the authors introduce so-called this uh, roulette wheel, which is like if you if you go to a casino, you see this roulette machine, then basically you try to pick some pick a fitness based on the weights. And it's not like casino, but because certain numbers will have better chance because of the fitness, but still it's like raw wheel. And sometimes you can also use like a tournament type of thing. Like in this evening's class, we have like a mini tournament. Whoever is most active will eventually get a trophy. Yes? Uh, on the previous slide, why would it be a bad thing if you reach a suboptimal solution? Well, it's, in fact, it's not a bad thing, but then depending, also depending on what we mean by suboptimal. In this context, I would say suboptimal means non-optimal. It's the best solution you have, but there's no way you can tell how close to the optimal one. And of course, it's just a competition because you can say this traveling salesman problem is NP hard. If the problem scale is large, like in real engineering application, nobody knows what the optimal solution is. Then, but still we can say whoever provided the better solution, we will immediately tell. Do you agree? And sometimes you have some kind of benchmark problem. You can easily determine the solution is good, that solution is not good. Because for instance, you have the scheduling problem. You say, well, I have one million jobs to be scheduled on maybe 10 processors. Then I have this schedule, and then let's say resting propose another schedule, then we can easily compare. If we set a goal to say like the com mission completion time to be minimized. But still, for instance, do I know how he designed the genetic algorithm in order to get to that solution? I don't. But still, if the solution is really good, then I think everyone's happy about that. OK. And of course, like I said, there are different issues in genetic algorithm. One is about how do we know the global optimal. And although there are some theoretical efforts tried, trying to explain, in some cases, genetic algorithm does get close to the optimal based on some survival analysis, and ergodicity of the Markov chain of this basic evolution strategy, and also how the parameter tuning can affect the performance to the genetic algorithm. But still, in practice, people rely a lot on the experience and the pro I explore the problem domain in you know, all these things. And of course, how to make the solution parallel? In genetic algorithm, in fact, that's not hard, right? If you have two processors, what do you do? You evaluate two different gene pools separately, and then you communicate when you do crossover or whatever. And then basically, you can easily make it parallel. And there's one issue, like random number generator, because a lot of mechanisms require what? Some kind of probabilistic weights. And that means a lot of computation will be dedicated not to the evaluation of the objective function, but what? to generating random numbers. Even though you may say, in MATLAB, I can easily generate 10 million random, random numbers, but still, it's part of the computation you cannot ignore. It's like you, whenever you evaluate one time the objective function, maybe associated 10 random number generation involved in order to get to the, how, fit, how 
this gene will be survived or maybe dedicated to part of its pool chromosome to the offspring or not. So these are important things to talk about. OK, and <clears throat> if you think about genetic algorithm was first designed to tackle some well-known NP-hard problem. And one example is traveling salesman problem. And it can be designed by using binary encoding where cities are binary coded and chromosome is string of bits. And sometimes you can design the parse by just using the numbered city so that the chromosome is a string of the integers. And sometimes you can use ordinal type of encoding cities are numbered, but the coding procedure is more or less complex. However, all possible chromosomes are legal and only one chromosome for each tour. So that this ordinal technique is very effective whenever you don't need to worry about when your generator of offspring, it is a feasible solution or not. Okay? And there are some other techniques to do that. And of course, the selection procedure like this roulette wheel, you can say take the sum of the fitness, we call that capital T, and we generate some random number between 1 and T, and return the chromosome whose fitness added to the running total, which is equal to or larger than n. And in that case, you can say the chance to be selected is exactly proportional to the fitness. And here's just one example. You'll say, I have this chromosome numbered in the ascending order one through six. The fitness value is given by these integers. And I calculate the running total like this. And then I generate a number basically within 1 to 49. And then, for instance, if it's 23, then I will select 3. And then you can see that because this fitness value is large, then what? The chance is larger. And this, of course, is very effective because this can be efficiently programmed. For instance, I think Mr. Wu is studying particle filtering. In that case, because of randomly generating particles and do so-called renormalization, then this procedure is considered very important to, to be part of the so-called particle resampling mechanism that you can use. And the tournament procedure, you can say, you can have different type of tournaments to do the selection. And binary tournament, which is like you have two individuals randomly chosen, the fitter one will be selected. And of course, you can say two individuals are randomly chosen with some probability, and then the fitter one will be selected. And you can select n individuals and then pick the fittest one. And of course, by changing this value n and the probability of p being selected for each individual, genetic algorithm can be adjusted dynamically. But overall, you can see the algorithm is just some conceptual flowchart to explore what the existing solution and maybe generating some new ones based on heuristics. So that's pretty much about all the variations of genetic algorithm. And there are some problems with how you determine the fitness range and how the, genet the population evolve from gener one generation to another. There are issues reported when people studying genetic algorithm. One is called the premature convergence, meaning that this fitness change is usually too large in the early stage and relatively you have some super fit individuals dominant the population. Later, no matter what, you always have a large pool like this. And I think in particle filter, you have maybe some kind of a particle depletion is similar to this phenomenon. And there's also another problem called the slow finishing, meaning that you have many diversity 
diversified populations, and then the fitness pressure is small so that you just keep exploring. Then what? Then it takes a very long time to get into those good candidates. So that's just too extreme about not making good trade-off between exploitation and exploration. So any solution to that? Here are just some suggestions, but now I would like to see like some of you may pro may propose something in this regard. If you see, for instance, too much exploration, what do you do? If you see too much exploitation, what do you do? Any idea? For instance, if you see too much exploration, that means what? You're wandering around that there's not enough select fitness pressure on the selection of good candidates to get to the next generation. So what do you do? I'm sorry? Mm, would that work? Well, maybe let me use some analogy here. Let's say if I use homework assignment as example, if I gave two easy problems, everyone get 10, then I cannot distinguish who's studying very well, right? If, on the other hand, if I gave two difficult problems, none of you guys can come up with a reasonable solution. Most of them cannot pass even maybe five or four, then that's not really good, right? So, okay, but then in optimization, what kind of idea can lead to that? Well, that you cannot change. The, the, fitness, the, the objective function you cannot change. What you can change is about from that to fitness. Exactly that what Gang Liu just mentioned. If you see that, then what? You just do some proper scaling on the fitness function from the objective to the fitness. Okay? Meaning what? For instance, maybe you introduce some uneven scale. Like maybe I just say, if I have five problems. All of you get the first three correct. I will not count those three. Right? I will only focus on those problems making difference. And same thing for fitness scaling and fitness windling and fitness ranking. These are just ideas to explicitly remap the objective function to whatever you call that fitness. And then, of course, you can do this roulette roulette, you can do a tournament, you can do other mechanism. And, and of course, those are all good ways to explore. OK, so if you think about <clears throat> the fitness function is really something very important to guide your genetic algorithm to <coughs> how it works. And the fitness values are scaled by either subtraction or division so that the worst value, you may say, will be close to zero. And the best value can be some certain value. And to make it simple, you can say typically two. But why two? Well, it's just for some, some way you can distinguish the, scale, the proper scale for the original genetic algorithm to run. And there are some problems with this idea because of some super fit or super unfit solutions can still destroy like your, your proper scale. But this can be solved by defining 
some maximum or minimum value of the fitness. So that if you, even if you have extreme fit, according to some criteria, still you reach certain level, you cannot get above that. Okay, but these are just basically <coughs> engineering intuition to make things work. You can say, well, you have some raw fitness function in this area, and then after a proper scaling adjustment, you shift this whole thing back to here. And there are some other techniques you can use the windowing technique, except that basically you <coughs> observe n previous generations and then you basically subtract out the minimum of that. And that's like you put a sliding window so that you scale your, object, your fitness according to what you already observed. And that's adaptive fitting into your design for the genetic algorithm. And the last idea called fitness ranking, which is also very straightforward because it doesn't, it will not be affected by super fit or super unfit individuals and sometimes can be superior to scaling and windling. And why is that? Because the ranking usually is just the older information without the relative amount. And that sometimes is good, can be good and bad, right? For instance, like I still use the analogy, like this grad, uh, this graduate, uh, this grade point average is considered by scale, right? And that destroy all the deep subtle issues of like maybe uh, based on a hundred mark of the performance. And you can say maybe it's a part of the quantization if you interpret that way. But basically it's just one ranking. So that basically students getting a B, you don't get like a B plus or B minus. And sometimes you may say this B is actually 89.9 and that B is 80.1. And then still we don't distinguish them and that's good or bad, and in this case, it just adjusts the fitness function to be not so sensitive to the, <coughs> to how to be trapped by some premature convergence or maybe slow convergence at the very end. One important aspect is that, how are you going to evaluate the fitness function? Sometimes this, even this can be a very difficult task because what some objective function may be very complex and sometimes you may have multi-objective fitness and you may have to make a trade-off between how much time you spend and what the quality you get. And you may not want to e exactly evaluate the objective function but try to get just the rough idea which one is better? And that's a, also a very interesting subject we can explore because, for instance, if you just want to know the preference, you can think about so-called dominance and indifference concept, which I think when we get into multi-objective optimization, we may have to <coughs> talk a little bit more about the mathematical rigorous description of this. If you think about an optimization problem with more than one objective function, you have two solutions, x1, x2, and then x1 dominates x2 if what? For all the objective functions, if x1 is better, f of x1 is better than f of x2 for all these different objectives, i from 1 through n. And x1 is indifferent with x2 if x1 doesn't dominate x2 and x2 doesn't dominate x1, which means what? Sometimes x1 is better, sometimes x2 is better, depending on which objective function you're looking into, right? And 
if you have multi-objective function, then what do you want to do? Well, you want to see what some kind of trade-off between like a time and quality, for instance, if you have two objectives. And what kind of trade-off you can say, well, I need to see the whole picture from one point to another, where I collect all those things, those extreme points where within the front, on the front, none of these points can dominate it one, uh, one another. Well, within the set, you have the dominance. So you can say there's so-called Pareto optimal set, and that's about those collection of the points where there's no solution in this search space that can dominate any member of this set. Then this set is considered Pareto optimal, or some people call this Pareto optimal front. Then you have two objectives, then this usually this front is just like a curve indicating the trade-off between one one objective with respect to another. And this basically is a way to see if one solution can dominate another. And this is also an important idea later when we get into so-called multi-objective optimization problem. <laughs> and in fact, if you have n objectives, how are you going to get into so-called Pareto front? It will be very difficult. So in general, what would people do? At least they will find some engineering trick or some easy solution to begin with. And one idea is to use a single objective function representing all n objective functions by so-called weighted sum, where these w1 through wn are the weights, usually non-negative, to indicate the importance of each objective function by some man-made preference. What would be the problem of this? Large. Large, and another is very small. OK. The scale may not be appropriate. Yes. It's hard to really find an appropriate weight to balance. Yes. Very good. For instance, if you think about the fitness function, that has one unit. And then the time you spend has a different unit. There's no way you can actually find a good linear combination to make them comparable to each other, right? The relative value may not be that crucial because, for instance, we are just trying to maximizing or minimizing mm -hmm. the objective function. I mean, if it's 10 million, but we are not, we are get, we are looking into the decision variable to get to maximum or minimum. The relative value doesn't really matter. What matters is that we cannot really compare. For instance, if you say this is like spending three minutes running genetic algorithm, and this is like maybe the accuracy up to certain length of the interval you are going to search, how are we going to compare? There's no way we can directly, they are in different units. And we have some other subtle issues when we think about, for instance, if you think this Pareto, front, Pareto optimal front is in general convex, but this thing, this cannot completely recover the full Pareto optimal front, even with all the possible weights that in your combination. Meaning that you can say any point in the, on the Pareto front, you may want to find a good way to design these Ws so that the optimal solution will get to that Pareto front point. On the other hand, if the Pareto front is not convex, then you cannot design those weights. And this is very sensitive to the shape of this optimal Pareto front. There are other issues 
like you need prior knowledge on how to determine the weights. I also like what Nan just mentioned. This may not be reliable when you have problem that involves uncertainty. So far, we only talk about objective function where you don't have any uncertainty at all. And when you evaluate this F1, you get deterministic number. There's no fluctuation. And sometimes you may say even a change in the fifth decimal of this decision variable in the constraint may change complete, completely change your solution to the linear program. And that sensitivity analysis later we may want to address a little bit. But in some real engineering application, maybe even you decision cannot be made based on reliable evaluating of the objective function, meaning that whenever you evaluate the objective function, you observe also some noise. And later, we are going to talk a little bit about that. And in that case, we call the whole problem a stochastic optimization problem, meaning that you have to face some uncertainty due to inaccurate evaluation of the objective function. But even in that case, we can still apply genetic algorithm. Well, for multi-objective multi fitness function, we can always try to <coughs> find a way to convert that into a single objective. The problem is that this requires some additional effort in designing the weights. And sometimes you may say these weights can be designed by some imprecisely specific multiple attribute utility theory, which is a special area study economic, economical analysis where they just model individuals as a rational player where they are interested in maximizing their own utility. And basically, economists tries to study the so-called social choice to see what would be the best in some configuration where like individual selfishness may lead to social inefficiency or sometimes may lead to social efficiency, then it's a good mechanism. And of course, this could have different ways to be determined by sometimes so-called preference function. If you have two individuals, x and y, we prefer x than y, then we say this function f of x is greater than y. And then basically, you can say all these will be preferred to x than y. And all the preferences actually constitute a linear space. If you don't know what linear space is, in fact, it, it is easy to say it's just some, some kind of space where basically you can do linear algebra to make it simple. But of course, it, in general, you have to have some good distance in order to measure, the, in order to, to define proper objective function. And for any kind of individual, you may want to know which one is preferable. And that's important. <coughs> Sometimes you may try to find these weights such that you can satisfy all the preference constraints in order to <coughs> in order to basically have a preliminary choice on how to combine multiple objectives. And what does that have anything to do with genetic algorithm? Well, you may say well, in general you have a comp very complex objective function. You may sometimes decompose that into simpler ones, which are easier to compute, more efficient. But how are you going to make trade-off? Then it becomes somehow related to multi-objective optimization. And of course, in that case, it's you can say maybe an, another important direction to look to explore in engineering optimization course, but probably I can only explain a little bit the basic idea how it works. And there are some other parameters in genetic algorithm which I probably will skip because 
whenever you have this whole algorithm in place, at some, most of the time you just get some commercial package or maybe even you can design your own simple genetic algorithm, which if you don't, maybe I can provide you some basic functions in MATLAB. And in optimization toolbox, I think it does provide some basic building blocks for you to easily construct genetic algorithm. And then you may see that sometimes the average performance and the best performance may behave very differently because of the way we design genetic algorithm. And here, we only looked into 20 generations, which sometimes is good enough to indicate if you have maxima or average in the steady state, then if you have an increasing trend, that's an indication there's a hope you can improve. But if you see some flight pattern like this, then probably you will stop your genetic algorithm. OK, so that means if you sometimes if you just keep the best one, then there's an indication there's no hope you can improve. But on average, you are still improving. So there's always an inherent difficulty about genetic algorithm on when you want to stop. But I will stop here for five minutes break. After that, we will get into simulated annealing, which is another global search technique. Well, I hope this will be the least mathematical lecture throughout. Because you don't see any equation, don't see any theoretical analysis. It's just basically hand waving suggestions on what to do. But that's probably the situation for so-called global search methods. Most of them are like that. I'm sorry? How will you do the test? Oh, in the exam, I cannot test you any of this. Well, I can have computer assignment, just give you some idea. For instance, maybe you implement, you see how it works. And you try to see if it's better than some other technique you can come up with. Yeah, maybe I should design a term project problem where you can use whatever optimization technique you see fit. And then whoever get the best performance, we'll, we will make an announcement and then maybe have some small trophy for that. Like a competition. <laughs> That's like a small competition, yeah. Well, the real engineering competition would be something like a large scale complicated problem. For instance, like this Netflix tries to track a huge database in order to predict the user behavior. And in that case, you have, for instance, maybe the whole movie database about the user activity and preference. And like Amazon has some huge database in order to have the personalized the recommendation on the product you're going to consider for, per, for future purchase. And these are all related to large scale optimization. The second phase of the design to trade off, if you do the trade off, the, to select the best uh, design, select the best uh, structural design. Well, how do you know it is best? It is the it's best design. Subjective, but, uh, well, you can say you make trade off based on the available information you have. Yeah, just like the multiple objective business, we, you, you give the 
Well, that's one way of doing. That's one way of doing the problem. It's not the only way to do multi-objective optimization. But of course, if you really want to do multi-objective optimization by looking, for instance, by constructing so-called Pareto front, that's already a very important task to to tackle, and there are different ways to do that. One is like rigorously, you can basically use standard optimization technique to, to handle that, or you just use global search methods, including particle swamp optimization to do that. And originally, we thought maybe Ryan want, wanted to implement something starting from the standard optimization technique for the parse planning, but later he ended up choosing this particle swamp algorithm, which is very easy to implement and it's intuitively appealing. And the only concern is that nobody knows what would be the best performance because the objective function is very difficult to evaluate. And And he may say that's really the best we can, we can come up with. And if you can beat that, then. The content you talk today, I think, is it in the text so far? Yes. You don't see it in the from the textbook. Maybe you use the old edition. It, does, it doesn't contain this chapter on global search algorithms. I'm sorry? Yeah, in, this, in the third edition, it, it contains this. Well, there are a lot. If you click external links and there are course blackboard, external links. Uh, the two external links. Well, under course blackboard, you see course, inf course document assignment and the external link. Uh -huh. External links contains many references. I, Inclu yeah, including classic textbook, electronic version of the optimization, all the aspects that I think are useful. And also I have five to seven books on reserve in the, at the UNO library. Those I think are complementary to what I'm talking about in the course. So, so for, for you, probably you may want to check, check it out. Okay, so simulated annealing, which is another technique that explores the I think we lost we lost the connection. It's back now. It works? Yes. Okay, good. And in this case, basically we are trying to explore so-called annealing process and the search for optimal in a more general system. The annealing process, which is considered like the, in, the, in, the, in standard physics, by raising the temperature up to a very high level, the atoms have a higher energy state and higher probability to rearrange in, the, in some crystalline structure. And cooling down slowly, 
the atoms have a lower and lower energy state, a smaller and smaller probability to rearrange the crystalline structure. But what does that have anything to do with optimization? Well, you'll see that, for instance, this metal may correspond to the, the problem you are going to optimize, and the energy state corresponds to the cost, cost function. And temperature is some control parameter you try to fine tune your search method. And this is basically a way to seek optimal solution by slowly cooling down. And in theory, you can say the global optimal solution can be achieved as long as the cooling process is slow enough. But how slow is considered slow enough? I would say unless you have a concrete problem, nobody knows how to, how to specify that. And in general, you have some essential step which just determine how you try to randomly explore new solution and then you either reject or accept the new solution with certain probability. And then you finish when you believe that this process already reached certain equilibrium. People call that metropolis criterion. And don't get confused if those of you who learned so-called Markov chain Monte Carlo method where you heard about so-called metropolis Hastings step, where basically it's similar to that, but it's just in the different context. And in this case, you can say X is some feasible solution you already have, and you want to explore some other solution, X prime, which is new solution. And then you have some energy on this state, which you could directly relate to, it to the objective function, okay? And then the probability of accept the new solution would depend on what? the difference between the old one and the new one, and also the temperature. And this temperature is like how you cool it down. Meaning what? If new solution is better, then you accept, right? And then if new solution is not better than the existing one, then what? With certain probability, you will accept. Why you want to do that? Yes. You don't want to be stuck you know, you you don't don't want want to with the existing one. You want to have, even though that solution is not good, you want to give it a chance. Later, maybe you can, from that solution, you can explore to a better one. Okay, so that's the idea. And the algorithm, of course, it's fairly simple. This is, you can say, just some kind of random search where you determine the highest temperature and the cool down temperature. And then once it has not reached the so-called equilibrium, then you just keep doing this probabilistic acceptance of the new solution and keep repeating the procedure and then you decrease the temperature, meaning what? Eventually, a worse solution will become more and more difficult to be accepted, right? And then what? When finally you cannot accept any wor worse solution than the existing one, you stop. Make sense? So, in general, if you think about simulated annealing, it's even simpler than genetic algorithm. You just define the solution and also the search mechanism, and then maybe you define how to explore from existing solution to its neighborhood. And then you run this simulated annealing based on so-called annealing schedule. Then eventually, when the temperature cools down, meaning that when you increase the probability of rejecting the worst solution until eventually you stop. What about control parameters? Well, in this case, it's mainly what? How you cool it down, the temp determin determination of the temperature. Remember, in genetic algorithm, we have how many design parameters?
Wow. I don't want the exact number. You can say a lot, right? For instance, population size, mutation crossover, how you design the crossover, mutation probability, selection mechanism, and also some fine tuning parameters, so on and so forth, and how you encode the feasible set, right? And in this case, you don't have so many choices. Basically, the most important control parameter is just the temperature. You want the initial temperature to be of about 80 to 90 acceptance rate, meaning what? Even though no matter how worse you get another solution, you want to have a chance to get to accept that and then try to explore more, right? And then the final temperature, which is some constant value based on the total number of solutions you already searched. If there's no improvement during the entire metropolis loop, then basically your acceptance rate is falling below some small value. And this, of course, depends on the problem. And still, you can see there's a so-called exploration and exploitation trade-off on this. And still, this simulate, simulated annealing has been accept, accepted as an important global search method and extensively tested. And this is an example on traveling salesman problem. If, let's say, we have six cities and the traveling costs between any two cities are given, a salesman needs to start from city one to travel all other cities and back to city one, and we want to minimize the total traveling cost. And this is a small scale problem. If you consider six cities, in fact, it's not really a big deal. But then if you think about solution representation, you can use a list of six integers to determine the tour. And of course, the search mechanism in simulated annealing, you could just swap any two integers. And then the cost function could be just like the distance you travel to complete the tour. And in this case, you may say the initial temperature should have about 80% acceptance rate, even for the bad move. And the, determine, uh, the determination of the acceptance basically can just depend on the difference between the traveling distance for, diff for two different tours, the old solution and the new one. And your final temperature, you need to find a way to basically have some small probability of accepting wor worse solution. And also you need to have a annealing schedule, meaning that you need to have a, like some kind of exponential cooldown of the temperature. Originally, maybe you cool down very fast, and later you need to make it slow so that you explore the phrase of the transition so that you can make sure that there's a really tiny chance for you to improve in the later stage. OK, so in general, what can we say about genetic algorithm and simulated annealing? Well, I think there's one practical saying on this, global optimal is possible, but near optimal solution is practical. Meaning what? My interpretation on this sentence is you get what you can afford to search, period. Because it is possible to get global optimal. That's only of theoretical interest, meaning that if you say this cooldown process can be arbitrarily long, for how long, I don't know. And the near optimal solution is practical. That means if essentially you stop somewhere, meaning that you don't want to explore any further because there's no hope you can improve. After so many times, then you stop. And the parameter tuning can be very tricky because even there's a whole book talking about simulated annealing and the connection to so-called Boltzmann machines, which is considered also an important invention belonging to so-called artificial neural network, studying how structure can be, can be formed based on small scale, self-evolved <coughs> self agents. And it's not easy to implement this simulated annealing in parallel as opposed to genetic algorithm. Why? Because the procedure is sequential. You cannot uh, 
in genetic algorithm, you keep what a pool of populations, right? In this case, what do you do? You just pump one at a time, right? And then you, when you control the cooldown process, you can now simultaneously evaluate many solutions and then, and then do a batch of decision on what to do next. So that's the major challenge. Okay. Before we get into the last technique, which is called the taboo search, let me ask you about what do you feel about the genetic algorithm and simulated annealing? Do you consider these are good engineering optimization techniques? If yes, why? If no, why? I mean, any opinion on that? Sam. Well, before I would be able to decide, I needed to see it perform on some benchmark or something versus some other type of algorithm, and that way I'll I'll have some empirical results to be able to say whether it's good or not. Okay. Well, for instance, there are so many different engineering problems to be explored, and there are so many benchmark problems you can test or evaluate. Like before getting into that, like. What makes you think that, for instance, these algorithms may work or may not work as well to some other algorithms you would like more? Well, the main thing for me is I just never heard of them before. So okay. I have no idea about their performance. Okay. That, that's fine. I, I think to most of you, maybe this this can be considered fairly new because well, there, there are many other non-popular, unpopular global search algorithms. But I picked two which are considered very popular in global in this global search algorithms category. So nobody else wants to add anything? You lack a simulated annealing. Well, any reason for that? I like the physical process of annealing. OK. So I, I like genetics as well, but I think the coding is going to be tricky. For but do you think that the simulated annealing may also need to consider how you encode the feasible solution? Yeah. Or? Oh, not not as much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Genetic algorithm has the advantage right now that it's easy to parallelize it very quickly. Okay. And it's really easy to get you know like four eight core processors nowadays. Okay. Even with just pumps. Yeah. And I think that's also a very important point. If you want, you can try to explore all the available computing resources. And by making it parallel is one attractive point. But what if I just simply do random search, and then I do the random search in parallel? Would that be better than genetic algorithm? Would that be worse? I think when I first encountered those methods, I keep thinking about that. What make you believe that you can do better in, in terms of global search than just purely random search? Yes? Well, purely random, your search is not guided in any fashion. OK. At least in the genetic algorithm, you try to have some direction based on the previous parents. But why do we need that? Uh, well, we don't we don't really follow gradient anymore in this case, and sometimes we don't even have any information about the gradient direction. And by the way, these global search methods also work for discrete optimization problem, like traveling salesman type of problem. Yes. Well, we're hoping two good answers might give us a slightly better answer. Okay. 
Yeah, I think, well, I think this is just the intuition that we say real engineering problems sometimes do have some structure for us to explore. If we already have some good solutions, we want to explore, if we want to exploit those solutions as well. And of course, how to explore, that's important. So we have the last technique I want to mention tonight, which is called taboo search. And this is close to another technique some people call local search. And this local doesn't necessarily mean neighborhood, but means something you can conveniently explore from here. For instance, I may say, if I know Rustin well, and he took optimization course with me, ask, for instance, Rustin, can you recommend some other graduate students to consider taking this course? That's like exploring just the neighborhood based on some connection in the analogy. And that doesn't really mean we need to measure the physical distance, but just a convenient way for us to say, there are some parses, search parses that we are, we feel convenient to come by. However, we do need to record the search history so that the search history so that we should ban some cycling in our search so that we don't duplicate the effort in doing that. So the idea is fairly simple. You can say, we choose some initial solution X, we generate a subset N of X as the neighbor of this X, which are not in this taboo list, meaning that they are not banned yet. And then we find the best one, which I call X prime in this neighborhood. And then what? Of course, if the, if the best one in the neighborhood is better than X, then what? We move to that place. And then what? Modify our taboo list and then do what? Explore another neighborhood, okay? And of course, we keep doing this until when? When will you stop? when all the neighborhood elements are marked in the taboo list, all what? All, all the best value is just a big. Oh, you, you cannot explore further on the neighborhood, right? Meaning that this is already best. No matter how I explore, I already have all my neighborhood are not as good as me, and then even from there, I cannot explore further. Other things are in the taboo list. Maybe another practical criterion would be when your boss tells you you have to stop, okay? So this, of course, there's no guarantee you can really get to the global optimal, but this also is <coughs> a very effective method to do the search. And if you do have the gradient direction, you, of course you can embed that information into your search method. But here we are just trying to focus on very generic problem. And we want to understand a little bit better about the neighborhood structure and the objective function, which is either fitness function or the cost. For example, if we solve some problem like a graph coloring problem, which is find the minimum number of colors needed such that no two connected nodes share the same color. Is that problem clear? If you have a graph with many nodes being connected to each other, you want to find one possible way to color these nodes so that no two connected nodes share the same color and you use the minimal number of colors to achieve that. I think there are... I'm sorry? 
It's what? So you think you can easily find the minimum number of colors required to achieve this? Depend on the graphical model. And in fact, this is also another NP complete problem. Yes. For what? For if the shape is uh, well, the shape looks like a simple polygon, then. Okay, yeah, of course, if you think about it, just for instance, if you have a map, you want to say I have 50 states, I want to use as minimum color as possible so that the two adjacent states will have different, all the adjacent states will have different color. Then that's a different, that's easier. And in fact, you know, like, no matter how complicated the states can connect to each other, you only need how many colors? Four. Four. Okay, so all of you know that. Do you know how to prove that? Okay, so if you do, then I, wish, you know, I mean, ask you the basic idea how to prove that. In fact, it's a difficult combinatorial problem. Originally, some mathematicians tried very hard saying, well, the proof can be very lengthy. They even require some search on different graphical configurations, and then they run computer program to enumerate maybe over 1,700 possible configurations, and then verify, that, yes, four colors are adequate. But then people say, would that be a mathematical proof if, for instance, it involves maybe this amount of computer code to describe about for the printout and the configurations to describe I enumerated that, then people say, wow, look, look very messy. Then I think only very recently, there's one mathematician proposed the only maybe three page proof based on very advanced math on this four color problem. But anyway, in general, this problem is hard and you can still explore this taboo search idea to just <laughs> overrule the constraints which violates your criteria. And in fact, you can think about how to explore the neighbor, the neighbor process, which you can store some existing solution and also the fitness difference in order to generate another one in your search for the neighborhood. And this problem is easier to be cast into this taboo search because what? Because you have the graphical structure, you can basically add a different color or explore the existing ones based on the existing configuration. And what you can do, of course, is just to control the memory usage where this size of the taboo list may increase theoretically exponentially fast as the size of your graph model of your graph model. But you can control a constant size of the taboo list. If it's too long, then basically it will deteriorate the deteriorate the search results. If it's too short, then you cannot effectively prevent from potential cycling of your search, then you waste your effort. And this basically will boil down to how you intensify or diversify the search. And in this case, you can see there's also a trade-off between what? Exploration and exploitation. Meaning what? Still the analogy, exploration means what? need to explore more about new things you have not heard of. And exploration means what? You believe whatever you have is considered good, good enough. I think even when you learn optimization course, sometimes you may need to have a trade-off, right? On um, what? For instance, exploration means maybe new stuff, fancy stuff global optimization methods, including genetic algorithms, simulated annealing, and many different new stuff. And ex uh, exploitation means you really need to maybe 
have some focus on one algorithm, understand it better, and try to maybe improve upon that algorithm to fit into your own engineering problem. It's like the breadth and depth of your knowledge, of your complete knowledge structure, which you may have to make some trade off because we are confined with our brain memory and our reasoning depths, even with the help of the computing technology. We cannot learn everything. All very thorough. We have to say we can explore as much as we want, but we can only be good at only a few things. And same thing when you think about optimization technique, a successful algorithm in global search is in general tailored to achieve a good trade-off between these two extremes so that it will effectively utilize the <coughs> effectively utilize the existing solution to generate good ones in the next stage, and also try to explore some new alternatives if possible. Well, I think some students like Gang Liu asked me about what are the references about this stuff, because in the textbook, only the new edition included global search algorithm as one chapter, and it doesn't really cover all the aspects like what I put in the slides. I would say that some, some references are good in the sense that you can know better. Some are good in the sense you know the theoretical depths about the reasoning behind it. I have some references on Blackboard and their external links. I believe some of you may already downloaded some electronic version of the textbook or references related to optimization. And also I have some Text, uh, some good references on the your library reserve desk so that you can probably explore. And I'm not sure if this is on the reserve, reserve desk, but probably you can, you can do an interlibrary loan to find this. And the problem is that if you think about an un, uh, undirected graph with these vertices, in the set of V and also the edges connecting the vertices in a set of E. And we want to determine a partition of the vertices in a minimal number of color class classes such that each edge connecting vertices VI and VG are not in the same color, in the same color class. And this graph partitioning problem is in general NP hard. And what are the approaches people use to solve this kind of NP-hard problem? In general, they transform this optimization problem into some kind of decision problem, where they combine genetic algorithm and taboo search to guide the crossover procedure and use this taboo list to confine the search only within some local neighborhood meaning that you don't really do this random permutation, but you try to guide through the structure of the problem. And this is considered the most effective way to date to tackle this kind of NP-hard problem. And I don't have good documentation on, for instance, some benchmark problems on which algorithm method works the best among this. And in fact, it's hard really to to see anything like that. But <clears throat> the actual implementation for that NP-hard problem involves many fine-tuning parameters. And sometimes, maybe the performance relies critically on how you fine-tune those parameters, including the pro uh, reproduction, uh, crossover, and other important issues in this Procedure. For instance, this so-called unified independent set crossover is an important way to construct a conflict-free node, node sets in order to just fit into this graph coloring problem. And you can think about you have some parents 
one and two, and then you can see there are some conflict and some non-conflict, and then basically when you do a crossover, you have two child, two child, two children, child one and child two, and they have their origins in this conflict set, and then you unify this by the unions of these two conflicting of subset, and then basically you try to resolve with a conflicting solution to get to the feasible set. And then with the mutation part, if you, if you put some probability of PW to randomly pick a neighbor, and then with some, with some complementary probability, you need to do a taboo search with some taboo list, where the list contains some <coughs> existing no, graph nodes where you already traveled and the solution may not be good, as good. And then, of course, you need to update this list based on some random permutation. And in general, I would say this taboo search sometimes is also called a local search as a way to explore the neighborhood. And taboo search prevents being trapped in some local minimal by constructing a taboo list and direct the selection from one neighbor to another. But it cannot guarantee the optimal result. And usually it can be made for even some sequential decision problem. Later we may get into that. And also it can be made adaptive so that it is popularly used in many combinatorial problems. Okay, so that's pretty much about the last method, which is called the taboo search. It's just search among some neighborhood and then create a taboo list and then basically explore more until you have nowhere to explore, I would say. And there are some other similar idea like some people call ant cloning technique. It's just analogy that an ant just try to explore about some, some colony so that it builds the colony and then from that base try to explore further. It can also be made in parallel because you can say I have many ants, I want to direct them to explore so that eventually they will travel most of the places so that they can cover the world. Because for instance, how many places you need, to try, you need to travel in order to know, for instance, what are the Earth's surface that you can reach? What are the boundaries? If you don't have any other aid, then what you hope is just like doing what? Taboo search. Whenever you get to a place, you mark it, I've been here, so what? Later I don't need to explore. And then where should I explore more? If you don't have map, well, you can say, well, whenever it's an uncharted territory, I should explore, and then just keep doing that, right? So this idea is really simple and nice. And in fact, it is considered a very crucial component to explore many NP-hard problems and try to end up with some satisfactory solution. Any questions? Okay, so now I would like each of you to give me one problem that you think it's an interesting optimization problem that you think it is difficult for you to solve. And you can have maybe five minutes to think about or maybe even discuss with your neighbor if you want and then 
And then maybe later we are going to think to discuss a little bit about those problems that we may want to put into perspective that you can. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's preferably related to your own research or maybe your own in your own project if, if you have one. Okay, so I guess we could get started if Nick, you want to go first. I'm just, just talking about there's a lot of things that, you know, the obvious things that I was interested in, which is more, uh, would be an exercise in the. Okay, can you pick one problem? Which is, you know, we're, we're just talk, discussing about how, how would you uh, break down something like as simple as an individual's usage of electricity at, the, at a local level. And, 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 if it, it, and the usage being big appliances like the, the HVAC system and the, the hot water system and things like okay, that. Okay, so. How they, their, uh, their usage without, in, in a way that. Individual usage, usage of utility, right? Yes. And you want to, the, the goal is to what? To. Well, the, the goal would be if you could uh, somewhat, uh, you know, ultimately, if everybody's using something at the same time, then the peak, the, the advantage of the, the power company is that everybody can flatten their curve on the usage base. Okay. Then you give them some sort of advantage in their rate structure to where they would get an advantage if they did this, meaning that they would get a cheaper rate. Okay, so basically, if you say, I want to predict the individual usage of the electric utility that would try to maybe schedule better way of the power generator so that it can I'm get the cheaper rate. I'm talking about an individual home. Okay. Individual home. You know, when you think about it. They're compromising the times that will be request power. Like well, you're not requesting. It's well, being used. Like if you have, the, you have the technology available that let's say cut off the compressor. But at the same time, a, a constraint would be you don't want your house to get too hot. Now, you want to have a certain comfortable temperature, but you're willing to sacrifice a little bit of temperature in your house okay. to, 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 to cut back the compression. Okay, so cut maybe you, you are talking about for even for an individual household, you want the electricity to be utilized in a smart way based on some yeah. central controller exactly. that's adaptive to the utility cost at different times. Right, on an industrial level, what we're, we're talking about is pushing that down to an individual user level, and making it to where that, that you could take a smarter use, if you will, of, which could be applied in that, that would, the incentive would be, if I got into this program, the incentive would be to, uh, to get a better rate. Okay. And so uh, if, if, you could, if you could operate within a certain envelope and keep your house relatively comfortable. Okay. And, 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 and not have to worry about, you can't, you got to turn the light on, you want the light to come on. 
Okay. Your bigger loads are going to be your HVAC system, your hot water system, if it's electric, okay? And those sort of things. And how would you smooth that out? The advantage to the utility is that if people are using power smarter, supposedly we're, we're optimizing our, uh, uh, our system, our overall system, okay. down to the very individual home level. If I may, can I ask which part you think it's considered particularly hard to solve this problem? The, the, the hardest part would be a hot day. It's hot. The, you want the air conditioner to work. That's the biggest thing, OK? Um, and, 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 and you're not going to want to constrain the kids or the wife necessarily from going to take a shower, which means you're utilizing the hot water, right? So how, how would yeah. you do that? How would you, how would you, how would you operate and optimize individual usage without actually constraining the people and saying, you can't do this? Well, so saying, okay, it's not time for you to take a shower today, you know, or, or a certain time. You have to wait until, until 1 o'clock in the morning to do it. And we don't want to do that, right? So how, how would you manipulate the variables to, 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 to do it? It's not, I don't think it's a question of just usage. It's, it's when it's being used. Okay, uh, but... I don't have the answer. I don't even know how to set the constraints for it. Well, <laughs> if I understand correctly, I would say modeling this as an optimization problem is harder than solving it, right? To begin with, how are we going to write this as an optimization problem? Yeah, right. good question. Because the discussion is a buzzword smart grid. And we, we have been using smart technologies for years at the generation and the, the transmission level, and to some level, aggregate distribution level. So how do you get that down to, to a user level? And, and I don't know if it's just technology. It's also maybe economic, an economic type thing where you offer certain rates. You know, if you we right now everybody's got the same rate. But what if I, I, I did something and and although we use we might use the same amount of electricity. But I actually get a better rate because of the way I'm using my electricity. You see my point? Yeah. I'm using my electricity smarter, so I get a better rate. How do you do that? Well, I think that there are two ends. One is like the utility company wants to implement that, oh, and then is the customer wants to obey certain usage of the electricity. And they, all these, of course, can be studied from different avenues of the research. But I would hope that eventually, maybe in your term project, you cut some piece of the you cut some piece of this into an optimization problem that we can talk about objective function and constraints. I have and, to name a model yet, but, but but that's that's a challenge. I think. Okay. The objective would be yeah, take the classic uh, generation <laughs> model. You know, an optimized generation has done this for so many years. You know, the penalty functions and stuff that uh, you know. For the transmission versus the generation, and, and uh, yeah, you can do that. Okay, I, so I, it might be a good uh, illustrative, illustrative thing for me to do, but uh, I don't know if I if I'm doing anything new. <laughs> well, Dr. Chin. yeah, uh, David, please. It it seems like with this problem, maybe the best answer is to have a variable cost for the for the electricity, so that at at off peak times you charge less for the electricity, and then it might encourage people to do things at different times that they normally wouldn't do. Well, yeah, of course, there are economic reasons for doing that. What I'm saying is this power utility consumption could be eventually deregulated and put that into maybe like a free market type of mechanism exactly. so, that, so that you can use whatever existing eco economy theory to analyze that. But that's beyond the scope of this course. What I'm saying is if you pick some topic that's reasonable to be optimized and then just justify that's useful maybe for smart grid, that would be considered a very good term project to begin with. Okay. So who wants to go next? And I think I'm thinking of uh, it's a personal investment, uh, personal finance. Investment, how to get the money more and more money. Mm -hmm. Well <laughs> so you know that so I, I think first just clarify the problem. You're you're trying to get what you're you're you're, you're talking about just investment on some securities. Not only security, but how to get more and more money. Well, there are different ways. Yeah. That some are beyond the scope of this course. For example, the, right now, <laughs> the the property 
price is going down, the rent price is zero. Is okay. But still so you can. I go rent or should I buy some property? Okay. That is the two strategy and two, that is one parameter. Okay, so you're talking about like some kind of investment, but in that case, which part you think it's optimization problem and which part is considered particularly hard? Because there are many options and uh, well, there are many percentages I can, I can choose. I can choose uh, how many percentages of my money investing. Well, are you talking about, for instance, just selecting the combination of your portfolio on stock and other thing, and other assets? Right. Okay, that's some, for instance, maybe you can say some kind of asset allocation problem. That's something maybe you can consider as potential cost project where that's already an optimization problem to begin with. You can define your goal, for instance, to maximize your average return subject to maybe some variation constraint. Or maybe you can have different criteria that provided you can solve the problem, then it's considered some reasonable problem. But still, you need to have a good model on, for instance, how the return will change over time, right? Like, for instance, you pay rent or you buy a house. Of course, you have the projection on the house value and also the rental rate and other things related to even property tax and so on and so forth. And I would say that's a very interesting optimization problem, but need to focus on something kind of interesting to be, to talk about, to be workable. So that's something very nice. Yes, Bryce. Okay, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, communication, how do you work communication? You're trying to uh, model the channel. Okay. To uh, run your simulation, the simulation of your, uh, of your model. Okay, so a channel means what? Something like when you transmit something under the water, you have the sender and then you have your receiver. Okay, somewhere you send some signal and then you receive something which is actually involved with whatever the channel model you have. So uh, in the experimental uh, data, we use uh, additional white brush Gaussian noise. Okay. But, uh, the problem is with different kind of uh, ocean and different kind of location, you have different kind of noise that adds to your channel. Okay. So what we're trying to do is create the best channel that would probably work. In but the channel model means you also need to characterize how the noise depend, yeah. depends on where you're transmitting, right? For instance, you'll say, well, because of the shell, this is shallow water, and that's different. Because the salinity is different, then you have different response. But the problem is, you have you have so many different noise, depending on the location, okay. that you, you cannot add all of them in the characterization of your channel. Okay. So you need to select a bunch, uh, a optimal number of them, so that you can actually say my channel is optimal. okay. So you can say some optimal choice yeah. of whatever to characterize the no the noise statistic yeah. of the underwater communication channel, right? Yeah. Like something like you have maybe 10 million factors to begin with, you may want to say what would be the best of five factors that can characterize this underwater communication channel. Yeah, you, you probably choose five, five uh, uh, if you're in the Pacific Ocean, you probably, okay. the Gulf, Mexico, Gulf of Mexico, you probably use five different Okay. Uh, but if you're somewhere in Canada or everyone, uh, yeah, I fully understand what you're talking sense. about. So we're trying to see if, it, if it's better to use A or B. Yeah, of course, five. it can be location specific. It can depend on all kind of environmental conditions. Yeah, and I, I believe that's a very difficult problem, and also it's hard to formal, formally describe that as an optimization problem because 
you don't know, for instance, how to evaluate different combinations of these factors in the perform in terms of the performance of the communication through their channel. So yeah, I think that that might be a potential topic for the term project. I think it's very interesting. The reason I'm asking is to see how you guys are interested in exploring different avenues in optimization. But these problems, I would say, are all discrete optimization in nature. And usually I would say discrete is even harder problem. OK, so next. Yes. Uh, this relates to my research. I have a set of linear paths whose order has been lost. OK. And uh, I want to reconstruct the ordering of those sets of linear paths. So uh, the idea is I'm using Markov, a Markov model here. And uh, by maximizing a score function, the ordering that maximizes a score function is the correct answer. OK, you maximize. <clears throat> Score Some score function. And here is with respect to different order. With, with, yes. And unfortunately, the score function I've been using likelihood so far. OK. Uh, the correct order only has average score. The correct order only, that doesn't really represent the maximum score. No, it doesn't represent the maximum score. So I don't know. If the, the model is the problem or the score function. Well, I guess, I guess it's about the modeling part. That maybe we can iterate, a, you know, refine minor. Because from your description, it seems that you are talking about some kind of score function which may not be very reliable to observe, right? When you say you have a linear path, you don't directly see that. You can only indirectly measure that, which means whenever you construct a likelihood function, you may the evaluation of that likelihood function may be perturbed by some noise. And that leads to so-called stochastic optimization problem, which may be only at the very end of the course. If time allows, I will cover that. But that's also a very interesting optimization problem to explore. OK, so if you want to. Okay. 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 Well, can can you be a little bit specific on the objective function? What you want to maximize or minimize? Okay, so let me just say if you have some say data set A, and then you can say that's like a B multiply some other matrix C, and then you'll say all the elements in B will be non negative, right? And C as And C also non negative. Okay. And you want to do the factorization like this, okay? Suppose I want to perform non-negative matrix factorization, so it is an optimization problem that I want to minimize the Jacobinus norm between A and B, B, C. A minus B, C, Jacobinus norm of But you said this is feasible, or this is not feasible. You just say. Minimize the, yeah, A minus. Subject to the elements of these are okay. So this this I can do because there are many many algorithms which uh, which do this. Yeah. But uh, uh, when I perform this uh, factorization, in, uh, I need to choose uh, I need to uh, choose the correct number of uh, how many columns should be there in the matrix B. Okay. And also and also I want I want to keep my matrix B very sparse because I need to have lots of zeros in that matrix. You want to control the sparsity of B. I and how are you going to control that? You want to put a penalty term on this. For instance, you can say lambda of the b's, whatever norm you want to put in. To ensure sparsity, maybe you need some kind of extended R1 norm. But you could, you could do that. I need to have lots of zeros in the matrix. 
Well, what do you mean by optimal in that case? Well, that 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 doesn't tell me like what you want to do because this criteria is either problem dependent, meaning that, for instance, you you pursue for the sparsest solution, that's fine. But sometimes you say that depends on your particular application, then it's something you cannot derive from your objective function. You can only propose some kind of model selection criteria saying that this model is better than the other one because so and so. That's related to your problem, maybe for bioinformatics. Or maybe I, I want to study the interrelationship between those number of, yep. number of bases and also the number of... Yeah, but what I'm saying is pursuing for sparsity solution is already an important optimization problem that I think you can explore some efficient algorithm along this revenue. For instance, I may cover a little bit like a greedy type of algorithm, including uh, basis pursuit and uh, orthogonal matching pursuit and some other variants in this course. So that I think that's good. Well, of course, we will iterate later. But that's a very good topic. OK. And anyone else? So David, yeah. Yeah, so this is the problem I tried to s describe in my email before. Where, So I, I've got, say, a, a sequence of video frames. Let's say I've got a thousand video frames. OK. And between each adjacent frame, from frame to frame, let's say I've got 30 known matches between each one. OK. Now, for each frame, I have an estimate of six variables that map that frame to the Earth. Okay. And it seems like my, my objective function should simply be a distance calculation because I'm trying to, um, uh, between, if I have two points that are actually the same point on the Earth, okay, between so two frames. Okay, so maybe let's say if you have a thousand frames, you want to find some criteria and that uh, measure how well you can match from one frame to another, right? Right. Like, like, right. The, cor like the point correspondences, for instance, if you say they match well, then you have small distance, otherwise you have larger total distance among those correspondence, correspondence points. Yeah, I think that and solving the best the correspondences is considered some kind of assignment problem. Among different frames, when the frame number is greater than or equal to three, in general, the problem is NP hard. But that's a very interesting optimization problem. And, and do you have any algorithm in mind you want to explore on this? Well, I, I've, already got, I've already got some tools to get homographies from one frame to the next. But okay. that just gives me the relative alignment from one frame to the next. Okay. Um, but and you want to the, go for the, multiple frames, right? The the goal is to map everything to the Earth and to have, um, you know, it seems like I have more knowns than I have than I have unknowns. But it seems like I have a lot of object, objective functions because basically each um, each match between each frame. Um, could be an, considered an objective function that I'd want to minimize to zero, but I have uh, a lot well, of objective functions. Well, you probably cannot get to zero, but at least you need to define the objective function. As like maybe the matching some distance to, to calculate how well certain points match to another set of points from one right. frame to another. And then you can accumulate this distance um, across different all the frames to find the best matching. And what I'm saying is, when you have multiple frames, the point of correspondence problem is in general NP hard. But that doesn't say we cannot find a reasonable algorithm to solve the problem and try to explore some efficient technique, including what I did in my PhD study based, based on so-called Lagrangian relaxation method. 
And that was in the paper that you sent me, right? I yes. Believe. Okay, so yeah, I think this is also a very interesting optimization problem to explore. So I would encourage you to maybe find some testing scenario and try to evaluate the performance of your optimization algorithm. Okay, so anyone else? <coughs> Okay, so you're thinking about the problem. So you, you convinced, I think you are convinced the problem is hard, right? Yes. You, you're talking about like maybe a few planes to cover, yeah, to cover some spots with the minimum completion time and also avoiding the obstacles like this, right? Yes. Right, okay. And do you have any techniques? I can do it with simulated annealing. Simulated annealing yes. to try on this, okay. I'm pretty sure I can do it with simulated. I might be able to do it with genetic algorithms. Okay. I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, and... Okay. But doing it with annealing, I think will work. It'll, it'll give you a, a pretty good solution. I don't know well, how, how, how does... Simulated annealing scale with this problem would be a, become an issue. I would suggest that maybe you should you will okay. spend some time learn this AMPL or CPLEX package at least get into so-called mixed linear integer programming formulation because that's considered like the baseline to really solve this type of problem. But I don't I don't know how to formulate it in in such a way. You know, well, I, I think we can, yeah, we can discuss about that if you okay. choose this as the project. Okay, so anyone else is left? Well, my question is similar, but it's pure integer least the square problem. Integer least the square, okay. You have a quadratic Okay, so you're talking about, for instance, AX equals to B, and you cannot solve this, so you want to minimize AX minus B, for instance, the, yeah, the Euclidean distance between that, and then subject to X belongs to just integers. Okay. Well, it's not an easy problem, but do you have any practical application you want to explore on this? Like, do you have any specific way to say about A and B, and like the condition number of the of matrix A or things like that? Uh, basically, one application of this one is that you can have the GPS face camera, right? Okay. Only can you can each for each GPS satellite you can measure only measure the fractional part of the camera face. Okay. You have the integer. And you want to recover the integer component, in, yeah, integer cap capability. Okay. Yeah. And what type of method do you want to address this? Well, uh, Relaxation or no, I still don't know. Bra branch and bond. Yep. <laughs> Well, that's yeah. Of course, that's for small scale problem. That's considered uh, the solution, the methodology to begin with. And also, there are some problems where you should explore so-called the total unimodularity for specific way of constructing this matrix A. I'm just curious. They, this method, it is applicable. Well, it is, but usually these are considered global techniques, meaning that it's problem independent. So, so if you have specific structure of the problem, you should explore that first before getting into very generic technique that's applicable. But of course, those things you can always try. In general, like what I told Rustin just now, if you understand about the problem structure better, you usually have a better way to solve that problem. Okay, so... Who will be the last one? Oh no, I think we still have two students left. Um, I'm 
Yeah. yeah. Thinking about the multiple processing, processor problem. Okay, so. Okay, you're talking about some like minimize the energy consumption with multiple process where you have multiple processors. Basically, you try to allocate what some kind of as a function of energy, and then you basically you try to achieve the computational requirement by minimizing the total energy consumed by multiple processors, right? And how many processors in general you, you're, you're dealing with? Well, I think you, you'd better look into that carefully and get, get to that. Yeah, I think that so far I don't think that's a really a well-formulated optimization problem, but we, we have to get into that later. And thought about this. Okay, yeah, then of course, do you have any problem in mind that you think it's the most difficult one? Okay, so you, you don't have a way to cast the research problem into an optimization problem yet. Okay, then yeah, of course you can still study a little bit about that. And okay, so I guess now seems that everyone already gave me some input about the project ideas, so that I would say, I would encourage each of you pursue along your own interest. But meanwhile, I will also think about maybe putting one assigned term project problem for you guys to also to consider as another option to look into. Okay, so now before I dismiss the class, I would like you, you guys to basically recommend who's the most active student in tonight's lecture. And we will not, I think we, we have the nomination of Lippi, right? And okay, so any objection? Okay, so I guess <coughs> most of, I think most students recommend Lippi to be the most active <coughs> speaker and she will get a small trophy. Uh, let's <coughs> give her some applause for uh, for being actively asking questions, I explain her opinion, no matter it is correct or incorrect, and just keep it up. And I would encourage other students to actually keep motivated to participate, to participate in the lecture instead of just reading the notes or the textbook, even though that, those are equally important. But I would say some immediate contact would actually help better in terms of giving me concrete feedback on what lecture material I want to explore. And next time, I don't think I have well designed the presentation slides for you guys. So I would maybe encourage one of you to take recitation notes while I prepare the lecture. And I will try to maybe use more on the scratch board and also the Project, uh, the document projector, so so the, the material, I would say, will be very important as well, which is mainly about if you have a large scale problem, how are you going to decompose that into smaller scale problems? I will introduce one important idea, which is called the duality theory. And that's very important because basically, because of the invention of duality theory, now people talk about solving millions of decision variables using distributed computational technique and still get to the global optimal solution without sacrificing some constraints. And we will get into that next, next week. So try to make it if you want to know the details. 
sorry about the delay for this lecture, but I just hope that you guys enjoyed about the tour for the global search algorithms. Thank you.